Hello everyone, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. I'm Dov Waxman, the director of the Nazarian Center and the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Professor of Israel Studies at UCLA. Our distinguished speaker today is Dr. Uri Biala, Emeritus Professor of International Relations at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the holder of the Morris B. Hexter Chair in International Relations and Middle East Studies. He's been a visiting fellow at St. Anthony's College of the University of Oxford, at the British Academy and at Harvard University, and a visiting professor at Monash University, the University of Chicago and Brandeis University. He has many publications, among them his books Between East and West, Israel's Foreign Policy Orientation, 1948 to 1956, which was published in 1990, Oil and the Arab-Israeli Conflict, 1948 to 1963, published in 1999, and Cross on the Star of David, The Christian World in Israel's Foreign Policy, 1948 to 1967, which was published in 2005. His latest book, which he'll be discussing, is Israeli Foreign Policy, A People Shall Not Dwell Alone, published by the Indiana University Press in 2020. The book lays a foundation for understanding the principal aspects of Israeli foreign policy from the earliest days of the state's existence until the Oslo Accords. And I'm delighted to welcome Professor Biala to join us today. He will um, speak for about 30, 40 minutes, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. So please send us your questions. We'll have lots of time for him to answer them at the end. Thank you, Professor Biala, for joining us. Thank you very much, Professor Waxman. I'm really privileged uh, to be here. And I'm very thankful for the invitation. Uh, it's been a very long time since I've been to your uni beautiful university. Now we are all at home, a different kind of a setting. Let's hope it's still uh, interesting to listen and to discuss it. Uh, let me say something about uh, what the book uh, is not. It is not a comprehensive history of Israel foreign policy, which uh, is beyond uh, any ability to, to do it in 300 pages. I decided instead to analyze part of the very rich historiography of the subject, uh, to which I contributed three books and 20 articles. Uh, so what you're going to listen to and what you're going to read in the book is a kind of a summing up of my own selection of the important and interesting general uh, aspect of Israel reform policy. Uh, let me, uh, uh, in a way, uh, this is highly original because you can't find in any university, in any bookstore, uh, an overall kind of uh, analysis of Israel foreign policy. It's either episodic or confined to, to a theme, central theme. Uh, there's nothing like a general kind of a book, a textbook, if you may, if you want. And this is what I was trying to do while at the Schusterman Center uh, at Brandeis. Uh, let me, uh, I'm going to share with you two major points that I'm making in the book and seven, what I define as nuggets, uh, issues, uh, episodes, uh, questions, historical questions, which I solve, try to analyze on the basis of, of, the, of the rich historiography. Uh, let me start with, uh, with, with, the, with the first one. The first one says the obvious, and that is that you can't really discuss Israel foreign policy without, without uh, giving due place to the history of Israel foreign policy, to the pre-state period. For various reasons, this has not been done. We have on the bookshelf either books dealing with Zionist history or books dealing with the foreign policy of Israel. There is very little in the way of connecting the two. And I think that they are well connected in order to understand the post-48 period, you have to understand the legacy of the pre-48 period. And I'm aiming at uh, several elements which should be remembered and analyzed. First of all, uh, the basis of Israel diplomacy, historical diplomacy, had to do with weakness, had to do with solidarity, and had to do with pragmatism. 
They're all there in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th century, and they're very much with us. People are going to uh, discuss and disagree with the notion of weakness, uh, but I think if you, if you take the entire period, this is a, a very important element to be, uh, to be remembered. Hence the need for diplomacy. The Jews needed diplomacy. Uh, another element which is central to the legacy is the art of persuasion. If you follow very closely what the Jews have been trying to do since, since, the, since the French Revolution or before, they were trying to convince. They were trying to enlighten, as it is said in, in, in Hebrew, Le'ir and Aim, to enlighten the others in more, using moral arguments, using material arguments, uh, in order to promote uh, their case. And usually what the, 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 the man who did it was what was termed at the time a half Jude, the Jew of the court, uh, who was trying to plead for the Jews and to, to, to secure their well-being. Herzl, in a way, was a modern version of the half Jude. Uh, in order to understand the, uh, the uh, legacy, uh, you have, and this is what I've done in the book, you have to, to, to answer the question of the legacy of three historical periods, very important period. One was the Jewish diplomacy of the pre, pre-19th century. The other was the Zionist diplomacy of the late 20th, 19th century, early 20th century. And last but not least is the diplomacy of the Jewish issue in Palestine. The Jews engaged in very intensive diplomacy uh, during these periods, and it all had an effect on the emerging fledgling state of Israel and its diplomacy. I should just give you two or three examples. The notion that there is nobody to talk to in terms of uh, Jewish relations with the Arabs in Palestine has been with the Jews for a very long time, but it had become a uh, faith. Uh, point of faith in the 20s and 30s. Uh, very important. Uh, remind us of what the Prime Minister Le Barak said about uh, Arafat. You can't, you don't have anyone to talk to. This has been with the issue for a very long time and Ben-Gurion carried that uh, in the, since the 20s and the 30s. Uh, take, for example, uh, Jewish diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Abdullah. The king, of, the king of Jordan. It has been established in the 20s. It flourished in the 30s. It reached a climax in 48, but it did not, it did not die after 48. It is still very much with, with us. And the relation with, with, with Abdullah, with the, Hashemite, with the Hashemite kings and rulers, is very much with us even today. So in order to understand, in order to understand the post-48, you need to follow very closely the pre-48. The last example that I, I would like to give uh, to that is the legacy of 48. Very little, surprisingly, very little has been written about what was left by 48, which uh, influences our foreign policy up to, up to the present. And I would say that a lot, just one tiny, and not tiny, so not so tiny example, is the issue of the nuclear weapon. The, the thought of, of, of making Israel a nuclear power was with the Lingurian in 1949, before the Soviet exploded their atomic weapon. Uh, it, was an, uh, it was a thought uh, that was based on the catastrophe of the Holocaust, the, the, the almost catastrophe of the 48th war, and the idea that war will be with us for, for ages, uh, hence the need for atomic weapons. So that's the legacy. That's point number one. Point number two had to do with the focus of research, focus of analysis, focus of study. Uh, many people, especially uh, political scientists educated in the United States, uh, emphasize endlessly the issue of war and peace, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. 
So if you go to North America and you would like to teach the Arab-Israeli conflict or anything to do with the foreign policy of Israel, you are expected to deal basically with the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, this has not been my reading of the documents, and many others are supporting my view. Uh, I base my conclusion on reading of documents. Uh, just give you one example. Uh, I read almost 30 volumes of the debate of the uh, Economic uh, Cabinet Committee, uh, in which the entire notion of what are we doing here. How shall we do it? And the pyramidal structure of the aims of Israel from policy has been exposed. And I have no doubt that during at least 20 or 4 or 30 years of Israel existence, if not more, the central notion was state building and not the Arab-Israel conflict. Ben-Gurion, Sharet, Ashkol, Rabin, and the others were all worried about building up a state, a viable state, a strong state, uh, and not just militarily, but economically, demographically, spiritually, etc. And this is what they devoted their time. If you read the cabinet minutes of the time, you, you, you really get it. What are they discussing? The Arab Israeli conflict, as far as my reading of, 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 of the period is concerned, was more a mean than an end of itself. Uh, so this is a second point, a central point, which uh, should be borne in mind. This leads me to the, uh, the third point, which I would like to make, and I call it nuggets. And I'm going to share with you some of the interesting findings which the documents tell. Let me start with uh, something which seemingly is a topical but not in the context of what I would like to, to tell you. Uh, the second state in the Middle East to have recognized Israel was Iran, or as it was termed at the time, Persia. Turkey was the first, Persia was the second, and the question arises, what on earth did Israel have to do with Persia at the time? Uh, and the answer is that it had to do with immigration of Jews coming from Iraq. They were trying to cross the borders illegally from Iraq, making their way to Palestine, and the only, vi the only viable road which they could take was through Iran or Persia. And Israel, Israel followed the, the issue, and with the help of a bribe, as it was termed at the time, clinging argument, uh, <clears throat> bribed the Prime Minister of Iran, it cost the state of Israel almost $100,000, and the Jews made their way from, uh, from Iraq to Iran. Uh, the relations developed later on, and I'm going to enlarge on that in a minute, when Israel needed oil and Iran became the main supplier of oil to Iran. Wonderful stories and wonderful uh, analysis of Israel foreign policy uh, and the importance of, of elements in Israel foreign policy had to do with Aliyah immigration. I have no doubt that it has been one of the major aims of the State of Israel to promote Aliyah. It is very much with us today. It was particularly with us then, at the late, at the mid late 40s, especially following the, the Holocaust. The main thrust of Aliyah at the time was Eastern Europe. And Israel was trying very hard, successfully at the time, to secure Aliyah. And the question arises, how did Israel promote Aliyah? How did it make it? And uh, the secret had to do with situation existing in Eastern Europe and the ability of Israel to play with it. Uh, speaking about Eastern Europe countries, they have several of them have interest in getting rid of Jews for various reasons, political, economic, uh, etc. They have the interest of getting rid of at least certain elements within the Jews, uh, and they charge money for each Jew going to, to Israel, and Israel pays a lot, paid a lot. 
Suffice it to say, and I have the numbers with me, that for, for 20 years, 20, his last 20 years, Nicolau Ceausescu in Romania got more than $100 million for the Jews coming from uh, Romania to Israel. And the dictator used to ask every time and again, how much did I make this week vis-a-vis -vis the Jews? Uh, it's not just bribery which Israel used. Israel greatly relied on the help of the joint the American Jewish community who had a freedom of action, relative freedom of action in Eastern Europe. He had more money than the poor state of Israel was able to, to, uh, to uh, mobilize. And with the help of the, of, of, of the joint, Israel uh, made a lot of success in securing Aliyah. One of the most important, interesting means that Israel used to promote Aliyah had to do with commerce. Uh, I'm an historical voyeur and I'm reading documents here and there, uh, trying to fish my way. One day I, I came across the documents indicating that Israel was one of the major exporters of copper. I was amazed, you know. Uh, we, we know the biblical saying, land of milk honey. I can't remember saying copper, although there are some reference to copper, uh, and I discovered that the, uh, the Israel used uh, transit commerce in order to secure copper to Eastern Europe at the time, at the height of the Cold War, when uh, the Americans declared embargo, economic embargo on Eastern Europe, and Israel was really breaking the American uh, the American embargo, uh, using its uh, ability to fish, to ship these commodities to ports on, in the Black Sea. So that, that's uh, immigration from Eastern Europe. Uh, the ability of the Jews, uh, the, ability, the ability of the state of Israel to maneuver in the international arena had a lot to do with the help rendered by Jews. Uh, all over the world. Uh, it is still an untold story, very little known about that for very good reasons. But there are some excellent examples of this help. One had to do with one of the biggest intelligence successes of Israel, uh, the acquisition of the entire private paper, private paper collection of the Mufti, Ajam Min al Husseini, the Palestinian leader in 47. 48. Uh, the man who uh, really did it for Israel was a former Israeli who uh, went on Aliyah or Yerida to the United States, settled there, became an intelligence officer of uh, the State Department at the time, uh, went to, uh, went to uh, Iran and then to Europe and helped the Jews get the collection of documents. Uh, the, amazed, the, the, the help which Jews could make of that collection, operationally speaking, and diplomatically speaking, and politically speaking, cannot be exaggerated. That's a wonderful example, which I found, and I wrote a learned article about that. And this brings me to a major point, a major issue, which the documents tell, and I wrote an entire learned a book about that, I had to do with, with oil. A state cannot, cannot exist without oil. Israel was surrounded by countries, by Middle East countries, some of them with, with, with oil, the others not, not in a need so much of that oil. Uh, and Israel, Israel was denied that oil from 47 to 48 with the approach of the War of Independence. Israel depended on oil in the pre-48 period. Uh, the British provided oil from Iraq by the pipeline leading from Kirkuk to Haifa, and oil coming from Persia uh, and Iraq going through the Suez Canal and Haifa. That all stopped in 1949. And Israel still managed to do that. 
uh, there are two stages to that story, and there are two wonderful, wonderful examples of the ingenuity of Israeli diplomacy. In 1950, 1951, Israel succeeded in threatening, threatening, I'm not kidding, in threatening the British that if they don't provide oil to Israel, Israel is going to close down the Haifa refinery. At that time, the Brits were in negotiation with the Iraqi government about, about, about oil royalties, and they feared that if the Jews managed to do that, the next in line would be the Iraqis, and the Iranians are not going to wait until they do it themselves. So the idea was to threaten the British with a domino theory, and it worked. It did just marvelous for the Jews, because the Jews managed to get the protection of the British for five, five or six years. And it all added up to, 90, uh, to the late 50s, when Iran became the major supplier of oil to Israel, and oil was the name of the game in terms of intelligence, in terms of the military, in terms of, of strategy. Uh, how did Israel manage to get the oil, the Iranian oil? Wonderful story. Simple as that. Israel was ready at the time to pay 25 more on the oil which it got from, the, from Iran. Nobody at the time was ready to do that, and Israel was ready to engage in that. So a clear balance sheet worked for Israel's sake, and it went on for a very, very long time. Uh, a wonderful story. Uh, one point before uh, I conclude uh, had to do with the, uh, with the history of the Mossad in Israeli foreign policy. Uh, you know, this is a hidden dimension of Israeli foreign policy because we cannot enjoy, we cannot benefit from the documents of the Mossad. Although there is a law in Israel uh, which make it illegal to hold back documents, the defense establishment, and especially the Mossad and the Shin Bek, are not obeying orders. Even the Prime Minister's office does not do that. And we are denied extremely important documents on the activities of the Mossad. One aspect of the Mossad activity had been exposed in my book, and I rely on others who did the, the, uh, the footwork, the research. Uh, and it appeared that in terms of our relation with Africa in the 50s and 60s, there were two players who had different kind of a game. Uh, you had the foreign ministry who had their own kind of uh, aims and especially means of action. And you had the Mossad who were playing a totally different kind of, of, of game. And I found out that the Mossad value Africa not so much because of its support of Israel uh, at the United Nations or in any international organization. The, uh, the, uh, the main reason why the Mossad value uh, our Africa presence in, in, in uh, our Israeli presence in Africa had to do with the ability to engage in all kinds of, of hidden activities which they were trying and managing to do for the sake of Israel. So the story is, 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 is a wonderful story. Uh, let me end or uh, say something about a very interesting question which bothered historians for a very long time. Why did Israel go to war in 1956? Common wisdom is that Israel went to war against uh, Nasser in 1956 because of the Czech arms deal. Uh, in 1955, because Lovaka sold a huge amount of uh, sophisticated weapons uh, to Egypt, breaking the, the military status quo in the Middle East, and forcing Israel to preempt. This is the conventional wisdom before Israel, Israelis uh, were allowed to go into the document. When they went into the document, they found out that by early 1956, Israel had the ability to counter the um, Egyptian military threat, which means that 
the, the French were at the time already telling or granting Israel large amount of sophisticated weapons, which really did not force Israel as such to go to war. Question arises, why did Israel go to war at the end? And the answer the documents are giving, not one single answer, but a, a very interesting answer given by the document, is that Ben-Gurion simply could not say no to the French. Uh, so it was not clear-cut defense calculation which forced Israel to invade Sinai in 1986, but the, the asking of the, especially the French, who was a very close ally at the time, military, not economically, but military and political ally of Israel, and Israel could not really stand the back. Uh, let me uh, end with uh, two or three uh, comments about, about failure in Israel's foreign policy. If the impression is that I, I, I give high mark to the ingenuity of Israel diplomacy, Israel foreign policy, uh, you're right, you're not wrong. On the other hand, one had to point to at least two major uh, failure of the state of Israel to reach uh, achievement in the international arena. One had to do with the uh, failure in the 50s, 60s to enter into the common market, uh, which um, made, I discussed that in a section called not so common market for Israel. And the second was a much more known episode in Israel foreign policy, and that's the Oslo, Oslo Accord. What we miss, and that's the last point I would like to make, what we miss is a large amount of documents of the defense establishment. We all know that they were, are, and will be engaged be in, 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 in foreign policy, not just defense policy, but foreign policy. We know that Israel is keeping close the lead over anything to do with, with, uh, with arms. I just came across a couple of uh, months ago uh, when I checked some documents in the Israel Foreign Ministry that a certain file dealing with purchase of pistols, Swedish pistols in 1950, is still declassified in the Israeli state archive. So could you imagine about the other issues more sensitive? We lack access to that material, which could change a lot our perception of Israel foreign policy. So we are still looking forward to changes in the practice of the Israeli government to allow citizens to know their government foreign policy system. And I'm, I think I have delivered enough uh, rabbits in the room to keep, keep us chasing them for at least half an hour. Thank you, uh, Professor Biala. That was fascinating. Um, I want to encourage all of uh, our listeners to please send in questions, and, I, and we have plenty of time uh, for your questions. But I want to begin with, uh, as the moderator uh, with a couple of my own. Um, first of all, just kind of more... Uh, more broadly in terms of your own role as a historian. Um, you know, you've covered uh, a long period of Israel's history, a period which is often controversial about which there are, you know, there's still ongoing debates and, and, and deep divisions among historians and, and others. Um, you've emphasized in your, in your remarks today, you know, the documentary record and, and reviewing the documentary record. So how do you see yourself as a historian kind of navigating this extremely often controversial topic um, about periods like the 1948 war? What is the role of a historian as you see, or at least how you've tried to uh, practice that role? Let me define myself. I, I think I'm an old new historian. Uh, new in terms of the material. I was sitting with Benny Morris in the Israeli State Archive year, ages ago. We both studied the same documents. He came with the history of the uh, Palestinian refugees, and I came with the Israel's foreign policy orientation between East and West. So we went to, to different kind of a way. Not just the, the subject, but the, the methodology. 
I think that the, the historian had more than enough to keep him going and to keep society uh, engaged in historical reading uh, if you confine yourself to explanation and not passing judgment. I think it's a bit unfair to criticize Begin, to criticize Rabin, to criticize, to criticize even, even Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, for one very important single reason. These leaders lack what every student of mine had during the long years I was teaching at the Hebrew University, and that is the bibliography. So uh, <clears throat> our leaders did not know the end of the story until it, 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 it happened. You historians, students, commentators are smarter, are much more well equipped in terms of intellectual ability uh, to to <coughs> sorry to answer all kind of questions. So I think it's a bit unfair to the leaders, to the historical heroes. Uh, does it mean that you can't criticize here and there what you read? Definitely yes, definitely yes. But that's the not that this is not the major axis. This is one of the reasons why I chose to part with Benny Morris. I intentionally avoided dealing with the Arab-Israeli conflict per se. First of all, because uh, many others are, are moving that road. Uh, it, it's really a motorway uh, full of scholars. And B, I think, and that led me to the conclusion, major, one of the major conclusions of, that present, of, of our today's presentation, uh, Israel was more, was more worried more about how to live under the shadow of the Arab-Israeli conflict than uh, under the shadow of the need to solve it peacefully. That was the main aim. And I relied on documents. I relied on mass of documents. I don't think many uh, has engaged in so many years, so many years, and I started that in the 80s, uh, reading so much document. And this is why I, I, I really, uh, I, I can speak with Benny Morris. We are, we are friends, but we decided to go two ways. And I think this is one of the one of the fascinating side of history. You can look at things, you can do things, you can say things, something different. You can be controversial. The people who are going to to enjoy that are your students, as long as you are opening your sources, you're opening the methodology, you are sharing it, and you are not mixing it with today's affairs. So I want to ask, you mentioned how there's been many, many works on, on the Arab-Israeli conflict. There's a lot of scholars working on that. Um, and yet um, there's been comparatively few scholars, such as yourself, working on Israeli foreign policy. Uh, very few kind of systematic studies of Israeli foreign policy. Um, why I, I can think of, you know, Michael Brecher's very kind of monumental study of Israeli foreign policy, but there's, you know, very few and far between. Why do you think that is? Why has there among scholars been such little kind of systematic study of Israel's foreign policy? Rather, you know, as, as I say, focusing on the Arab Israeli conflict or certain aspects of it, but not kind of studying Israel's foreign policy. First of all, uh... Have to do, you have to know the, the timetable of the historiography. Until the 90s, uh, the, the, most of the literature that I'm relying on was published in the 90s, because by the mid-80s, the government allowed access to documents relating to the 48th War. So uh, what distinguished between me and Michael Breacher that you name and uh, Aaron Kleiman, which you didn't uh, name, is the fact that they did not have the document. They relied on the press, they relied on oral history, they relied and they relied on, 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 on people who were sharing with them some of the documents. The documents were not there. Uh, so this is also another explanation why not many people wrote about 
about Israel foreign policy because if you want really to write something meaningful, you have to have the document. A, a third element which should be borne in mind answering your question had to do with secrecy. Israel is the only country in the world that I came across where you can find a book, a heavy book of more than 300 pages, uh, analyzing code names during a certain period of time. Uh, Israel, I have with me in my library this kind of book called Zar Lo Yavin, A Stranger Will Not Understand, of code name used during the mandatory period. Israel was very secretive in terms of foreign policy. It sounds very unreal during today when you read about the cabinet conclusions before they are being taken care of or decided upon, but that was not the situation for a very long time. This is why it made it very difficult for Michael Breacher and even Aaron Kleiman to engage in an ordinary research about Israel foreign policy. It all changed in the late 80s and early 90s. And my book is really a sign that we've come of age. That something is moving, and I expect this area of study to develop a lot during the forthcoming years. So I, I wanted just to follow on from that. Uh, you know, um, a very famous scholar of foreign policy and practitioner of school, uh, foreign policy, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, I think uh, famously quit that, you know, Israel has no foreign policy, only domestic politics. Um, what's your response to, to that view that really, you know, it's just driven by domestic politics and coalition politics in particular, rather than any sort of systematic, coherent approach to foreign policy? Uh, it's a complicated, complicated question, fascinating question. Uh, you can engage in a whole seminar about that. Let me share with you some of my thoughts uh, about that. First of all, you have to distinguish between what the public is interested in and what the government is really doing or interested in. Uh, central issues of Israel foreign policy are beyond the interest not to say understanding of Israeli public. Take, for example, the common market, the issue of our relation with Europe. Aside from a couple of articles in the Aretz, uh, you can't really find references in the press or in the popular press about Israel's relation with Europe, which is the major provider of economic, uh, of, of economic research and development in, in Israel. So the interest of the public is one barrier, one barrier to that. Uh, on the other hand, issues relating to the Arab-Israeli conflict, especially since 1967, have really divided Jews in Israel and uh, became uh, fuel for political action, reaction, uh, activity, speeches, etc of political parties and factions in Israeli life. And that really explained why, in terms of the Arab-Israeli conflict, Kissinger is right. He is wrong about our relations with other uh, actors in the international arena. This is one answer. The second answer is that if you're following very closely, very closely, other states, I don't think you are going to meet different kind of an answer to that, or a different kind of analysis. Uh, politicians are engaged in what interests them, in on what interests their constituency. Uh, and in Israel, I think, not less than in other places, internal politics, internal politics, or as the German philosopher uh, Ranke said, inner politics is always more important than, than outside politics, external politics because it's more relevant to the daily life, to the daily existential question of, of, of the citizen. And this is why what Kissinger said is, right, but I'm not, I'm not very, uh, I, I'm, I'm not admiring him for this kind of, of reference. As a matter of fact, I was uh, with, with the foreign ministry in, in, the, in 75, when we were engaged in discussion with Kissinger about the disagreement, agree, this uh, uh, 
uh, relation in, in Sinai, and I was one of the team who prepared for Kissinger memos. So that brings me back to Kissinger. Yeah. Um, I wonder, uh, you know, in a sense, some of the achievements of Israel's foreign policy that you, you've mentioned haven't been as widely recognized or, or celebrated even as maybe its military achievements or its technological achievements. There seems to be, and this is a sweeping generalization, so forgive me, um, a kind of devaluing or even disdain in some quarters for diplomacy and for foreign policy. And that's often being manifested bureaucratically with the um, both budgetary and kind of higher prestige of the defense ministry over the foreign over the foreign ministry in recent years, the fact that Israel hasn't even had always an active foreign minister, rather the prime minister Benjamin Netanyahu has kind of taken on that role. It, it, is some is your work in some sense an attempt to provide a corrective to that view, to to to, to emphasise the value of diplomacy and and foreign relations in Israel's history, and not just this kind of emphasis upon you know Israel's military might. I think that. The opening of the documents would necessarily open up new topics. New topics are going to, are going to go to where there are not, not much uh, writing, you know, following the academic reality uh, of, of trying to innovate. And if you're trying to innovate, you go to, to topics uh, like myself, uh, Israel and the issue of oil, Israel and the issue of relation with the Christian world, which were not popular, not popular. The expert dealt with that, the foreign ministry expert dealt with that, not the army, neither the Mossad, and hence the proof that there is much more than meets the eye in terms of Israel foreign policy. And I totally agree with you, I totally agree with you. The opening of the new sources are going to redress the balance. Speaking about historical development, uh, the, the demise of the foreign ministry uh, started before, even before 48, with the ascent of power, of power to Ben-Gurion, uh, which coincided with the downfall, with the murder of, of Arlozov, who headed the political department of the Jewish agency. Uh, that was the beginning of a long and agonizing demise of the foreign ministry or the political uh, department of the Jewish agency to be followed by, uh, by Israeli uh, foreign ministry. It has been a very long, uh, very long process, which was closely connected to Ben-Gurion. Uh, and my friend and colleague, and colleague uh, all over the world are, are experts uh, on, on, on that issue of Tarek representing the foreign ministry, and Bergurian representing the defense and prime minister office and their ability to really do whatever they want. On the other hand, Bergurian, and again, I'm repeating myself, Bergurian and the defense ministries were not always engaged in the entire spectrum of Israel foreign policy. And that left not just the foreign ministry to, uh, to do things, it left us historians to follow what they were doing. So I, I want to turn to a couple of questions we're having from the audience. Um, uh, one question from uh, Gary Gilbert asks whether there's a difference in the foreign policy approaches of uh, Labour and Likud historically. Or, um, I mean, is there a kind of uh, long-term di division of opinion about how Israel's foreign policy should be con conducted between, you know, left and right, or center left and center right. I don't think that there was a major dis debate about how to do foreign policy. Uh, I don't think that either Likud or Labour really devoted a lot of time to this kind of a question. Aside from the time when Begin uh, and the demise of Begin and the demise of Ben Gurion, but aside from that, that was not the issue. The, the issue was definitely the land of Israel. The issue was definitely a resort to power, military power. Uh, the issue was definitely uh, relating to the, to the problem of borders at the time. And they differ. They differ. Begin differed than Mangurian for sure. Uh, the time of the 50s, 60s, 
and even 70s witnessed the polarization of visa fraud policy. On the other hand, the roots of the current situation, uh, if you follow very closely, were all there. Uh, not so much the turn left of the, of the Likud. This did not happen. Uh, the Likud witness turned to the right, uh, but the turning to the right within Labour Party, that was a major kind of, of, of development which greatly affected Israeli political life later on. So um, we have a question about uh, Israel's relations with, with, with great powers. Um, and the, the question asks whether you think it's important for Israel to develop relations with other great powers like China rather than rely largely on its relationship with the US. I want to kind of expand on that question a little bit and ask you about the belief that Israel needs a great power patron. Going back to, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, the history of Jewish diplomacy and then, and then Zionist diplomacy. And there was kind of a common theme is seeking out the great, a patron, the great power, the most powerful, and, and, and cultivating a kind of an alliance of sorts between uh, the weaker part, between, with this great power. Is that a constant, this need for um, a patron or a great power? And, and how do you see that today? Is it important for Israel to try to maybe establish um, uh, relations with other great powers and not be so reliant upon the United States? I would start with methodology. Had it been possible to play a game like children and start from scratch, I would give you some kind of, a, of an answer to that. However, we are not playing this kind of a game. We are living in the 21st century. We are living in a situation where the United States has been established as a major supporter of the State of Israel economically, militarily, diplomatically, etc. And I don't see any other major power doing the same. Simple as that. So I think it's very unreal to speak today about alternative to the United States. It's a different story if you ask yourself, are you free to engage in this or, or, the, or the other kind of activity vis-a-vis -vis China or vis-a-vis -vis Russia? Are you endangering relation with the United States? This is a different kind of a question, uh, which necessitates different kind of an answer. But uh, the clear-cut solution or the clear-cut declaration that you are looking for, I don't think it's realistic. It's even stupid. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, I want to ask you about, you, you mentioned uh, the important role that diaspora Jewry, diaspora Jews have, have played in Israel's foreign policy historically. Um, I want to ask you about how Israeli foreign policy makers have balanced the need to consider the interests of diaspora Jews and diaspora Jewish communities around the world in their foreign policy. How important, you mentioned Aliyah, but other than trying to encourage Jews to move to Israel and to make it possible for Jews uh, to move to Israel, how else has Israel tried to address the, the, the needs, the concerns of diaspora Jews? Has that sometimes especially when that's come at the intention with their relations with other states, like, I mean, most famously, you have the Soviet Union, but also many other countries like uh, Argentina or South Africa, where Israel has maintained relations, which also have their own diaspora Jewish communities that have sometimes um, not been happy about those relationships, let's say. Um, I think the... The acid test of your question uh, is a situation which simplifies, simplifies the, the, you know, the problem. And that is, what do you do when there is a situation where on the one hand you have a raison d'etat, Israel as a, as a, as a d'etat, the, the state, and Jewish interests? How do you play the game? Uh, scholars have been researching that not very profoundly because they lack documents. This is considered, still considered a sensitive topic in, in Israel for very good reasons. They came to the conclusion that, basically speaking, in overall, Israel has opted almost every time and again for raison d'etat. 
the the examples are 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 many. You spoke about Argentina. I would remind the audience that Israel decided to to kidnap uh, Eichmann from Argentina, and there was no real politic reasons for that. Ben Gurion did it for educational reasons. That was it. That was the reason for Ben Gurion doing it. So it was not real politic on the one hand and the Jews on the other. It was uh, something to do with educating Israeli youngsters about the Holocaust vis-a-vis the interest of Jews in Argentina. And Ben Gurion did not hesitate, did not hesitate at all to opt for raison d'etat. And uh, the price that Israel paid for that was very dear. The same apply to Israel's relation with, with Uh, with Argentina in terms of weapons at the time for a very long time. Although in this case, you have a raison d'etat selling arms, uh, interests of the defense establishment for doing that on the one hand, and Jews, liberal Jews in Argentina on the other. So you can go on and, and find many other examples. And the rule of the time is that Israel is, an, in terms of the relation with the Jews, very egoistic. Thank you. So I want to ask a question um, uh, from uh, Ari Kakovitz, who's, uh, who I'm sure you know well, um, asking you about um, whether you would characterize, if you take away the kind of Jewish dimension of Israeli foreign policy, whether uh, you would characterize it as a realist foreign policy. I mean, is essentially, is, is Israeli foreign policy a reflection of Israel's size, geogra- ge- uh, geostrategic like, significance, it's, it's um, small. Is it driven by these factors and the kind of cultural or historical legacy, the Jewish legacy is relatively unimportant? Would you say a kind of realism is the best uh, uh, international relations theory to describe Israel's foreign policy historically? Again, again, uh, the answer is, The question is, is, is excellent, and I thank you, Arya, for raising it. Arya was a former student of mine at the Hebrew University, following my track and his teaching in international relations and foreign policy at the Hebrew University. So greeting, Arya. Uh, the question I had to do with the with percentage. I mean, uh, we all know, we all know, That the the question is the question is about the, how do how did you define that the the realist uh, the kind of re- oh, yeah you define realism uh, I would say that three quarters of the Israeli decisions in terms of foreign policy are based on real politics. I was for preparing that lecture. I looked for cases which I can share with you about uh, issues. Where Israel opted for ideal politic and not real politic. I came across the first example that had to do with Spain. Israel declined to, to shake hands with the French, with the Spanish uh, in the 50s because they were supporting Hitler at the time. And there were other cases where Israel played this kind of a game. But on the other hand, most of the cases that I can remember of, real politic really explained it. So if I, if, if, I go, if I go to the moon and I have to teach Israel from a policy to people who are living in the moon, I would say that basically speaking, Israel is really a real politic kind of a state with exception. So we have a, um, a time for a couple more questions. I want to ask a question that's coming from uh, Jeff uh, Zimmerman, who's asking about the role of leader, uh, Israeli leaders, Israeli prime ministers. Has there been a, a particular prime minister, perhaps Ben-Gurion uh, or, or, or his, one of his successors, who's really um, altered the path of Israeli foreign policy, who's really had a decisive influence in, in shaping Israeli foreign policy and maybe changing the, its, di- its direction? Uh, another simple and complicated question. On the one hand, there is no argument that Ben-Gurion is still considered to be the most influential prime minister Israel ever, ever had. And I won't go into that. Suffice is to follow what was written about Ben-Gurion. Suffice is to understand that there was no really revisionist approach vis-a-vis Ben-Gurion. People can uh, criticize here and there, 
but basically speaking, they all admit that the man was uh, really uh, unique in terms of ability, in terms of influence, in terms of perception, in terms of, of, of the power to carry a fledgling state within. So Ben-Gurion is, is a definite answer. Uh, others were not so clear. The answer is not so clear. I, know, I don't want to go into that. I would like to elaborate on something which people are not aware of. Uh, the Prime Minister differed from one another in their w ability to work with the with, with Foreign Minister, with the Defense Establishment, etc. And not just leading the state, they are orchestrating an administrative machinery. And you would be surprised to have my opinion that Shamir was a first-class prime minister. And I'm speaking from inside knowledge about the foreign ministry. He was a first-class uh, foreign ministry official. He was not a foreign minister at the time. I speak about the abilities of prime minister. So that, 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 this is very interesting. Uh, but they were different. They, they differ. Uh, Rabin in the first tenure was not such, such a good prime minister. The second time was a much better prime minister and was murder alarm, uh, you all know. Uh, Golda Meir was not, so much, not, not a good uh, foreign minister, neither was she a, prime, a good prime minister at the time. Eshkol was a superb prime minister. That would surprise people. Historians are united in their, in their verdict that uh, Eshkol played qualifications which made him really primus inter pares. Uh, his ability to compromise, his ability to work with people, his ability not to antagonize, his building bridges to the enemies, his ability to prevent unnecessary war for six or seven years. We know the story now. Uh, and made him a really a prominent prime minister. So it, it, it's a wonderful topic. I would strongly urge students uh, to engage in this kind of comparison and perhaps to give us a reason to ask to, be, to, to, ask to your uh, webinar and, and speak about that. I'm, I'm ready to comment. Great. Well, thanks. We'll, we'll bring you back for that. Um, we have time just for one final question. I want to ask a question that's coming from a... Well, one of our professors here at UCLA, who's actually teaching a course currently on uh, the history of Israel's foreign relations, in which they've, he's using your book and a number of his students who are attending this webinar. Um, and he's asked you, he's asking about the role of diaspora Jews in, 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 ser in helping uh, Israeli foreign policy and serving Israeli foreign policy. He gives, gives the example of the Jewish businessman, Shaul Eisenberg, who helped launch Israel relations between Israel and China. Um, so if you could comment on the influential role that individual diaspora Jews have played in Israel's foreign relations, um, in sometimes you know, working behind the scenes to create agreements or diplomatic breakthroughs where Israeli foreign policy hasn't been able to or has been barred from having relations with those. Is that, and is that unique or one of the unique features of Israeli foreign policy is this role of uh, uh, individual Jews in the diaspora? Let me start with a with, with vignette that I got from the memoirs of you know, one Israeli diplomat who served in Africa and in, in Europe and in Asia. And he shared with the readers the secret of his success as a diplomat. And he, he writes that when, uh, when he went overseas, uh, he went to see Moshe Sharet, the foreign minister at the time, for his advice. And Moshe Sharet told him, the first thing you do when you come to whatever this, I can't remember the name of the country, you go to the synagogue. You go to the synagogue. Once you are in the synagogue, you, are, you, you have your way. Uh, a wonderful kind of a vignette which explains the ability of Israeli missionaries all over the world to rely on the help of the Jews. And this is the kind of a stories which are not told so much, and not because they raise the issue, the notion of the dual, dual loyalty of many, many Jews. But if something happened and these documents are being disclosed, that could be a major, a major contribution to the foreign policy of Israel. There's no doubt to me and I came across many in, in real life 
and in, in, in historiography and bibliography. There are many, many people who, uh, to whom the state of Israel owe gratitude for, for rendering help. A wonderful topic, another wonderful topic. Well, perhaps that will be the subject of your next book, which would, if, if it is, we would be only too happy to, to welcome you back to talk about that one day. Um, I wish I had uh, more time to ask you questions because we have lots of, we've had questions coming in and fascinating, fascinating subject. And you've had uh, so many great insights. And I really want to thank you on behalf of the Nazarian Center and our audience for sharing your, your wisdom and your, your learning with us today. And I want to thank all of the audience for joining us on this webinar. Um, uh, on behalf of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies, I thank you. And hopefully I'll see you again soon. Thanks. And thank you so much for inviting me. And thank you for the audience for the very illuminating and, 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 and interesting questions.